Welcome to another Shark Attack Stories Marathon showcasing some of the most brutal shark attacks covered on the channel so far. These stories include a mother of quadruplets who was bitten in half by a massive great white shark, a surfer who was eaten alive by the biggest shark ever recorded, and much more. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are the most savage shark attack stories you will ever hear. Welcome to Final Affliction. December 19, 1981. The sun decided it was too shy for today as it hid behind the gray clouds looming over California. Many were bothered by the overcast weather. There were not many souls that ventured to the coastlines of the beach-clad state. However, enthusiasts and surfers wanted to take advantage of the storm swell caused by the cold, windy weather. Lewis Archer Boren woke up to his alarm. Although most people would sleep off Saturday mornings, the curly-haired adventure seeker had always been fond of the ocean, and the ocean welcomed him. He planned on surfing the waves of South Moss Beach with a friend, expecting it to be just another typical day. He quickly got up from bed, ate breakfast, and said goodbye to his parents. He got out into the driveway and strapped his 5-foot, 4-inch surfboard on the roof rack of his car. The board was colored yellow and had a black border by the edges. Coupled with the surfer's hand stretched wide while lying on the board, the silhouette from under the ocean eerily looked like a seal. However, this was not in Lewis's mind at the time. He beamed like a child as he maneuvered the car out of the residence, unbeknownst to him, this would be his last goodbye. He drove carefully, reaching South Moss Beach still early in the morning before the rendezvous time. The smell of the ocean permeated the air, promising Lewis another excellent surfing session. Since 1899, there have been six fatal attacks from sharks in California, five of them from great white sharks. Although this pattern would easily send chills down anyone's spine and make them warier of entering the waters, fatal attacks from sharks are not really that frequent. Additionally, surfers know precisely the risk they're putting themselves in while practicing their sport. Unfortunately, Lewis never knew he would be the victim of one such brutal attack. Inhaling the sea breeze, the two friends stood patiently on the coastline, peering across the lonely, turbulent sea of South Moss Beach. The two looked out over the greasy, damp kelp beds underneath the gloomy sky. It floated in large, silent rafts colored brown as though serpents were churning beneath them. The waves were blown out on the reef, scaling up to 15 feet high, driven by the cold winds that day. Not a single soul was riding the waves. How could they not take advantage of this, Lewis and his friend thought. The two men pulled on their wetsuits, laughing and talking, catching up as friends would do. They paced along the coastline for a while, stalking the opportunity and getting a general feel of the atmosphere. Lewis and his friend were experienced anyway and didn't share the fear non-surfers felt. The ocean was their home. The two entered the cold waters and paddled out into the open. Floating on the surface, they sat on their boards, waiting for the perfect opportunity. When the winds favored their request, they lay down on their stomachs, pointing their toes towards the surfboard's tail and paralleled their heads to the stringer. They paddled slowly and then quickly, sighting the incoming waves from their periphery. In almost perfect synchronicity, the two young men placed their hands underneath their shoulders, prepping for the exhilarating moment. As the wave warmly welcomed the two surfers, they pushed against their boards, propping their torsos like cobras, and in one fluid motion, Lewis and his friend jumped to their knees. They took a couple of waves in this position, feeling the balance of the board, something they had done a thousand times already, not realizing a sinister force was brewing underneath the surface. They did this over and over until morning faded into the afternoon. Eventually, it was time to go. Afterward, they returned to the parking area and enjoyed their lunch, talking about surfing, life, and family, and other things that young men in their 20s spoke about. At approximately 2 p.m., Lewis and his friends parted ways, not realizing this was the last time they'd see each other. As Lewis made his way back into the car, he felt an urge in his chest. He dazedly stood beside his car with a half-hearted stance, thinking it would be such a waste to let the beautiful waves go. He bathed in the deserted scenery and decided to hit the waters one more time. Just another short session and then he'd go home. Or so he thought. Lewis made his way back to the beach. 
pacing along the coastline and trying to get a feel for things once more. This time, he was truly alone. However, it didn't matter to Lewis. The storm swell did not happen every day, and he wanted to take advantage of the great waves. He donned his wetsuit and began paddling into the open waters. The sound of the churning ocean filled the air, and a dreading atmosphere washed over Lewis. From underneath him, a fearsome creature watched. The great white shark tilted its head, moving a few meters swiftly under Lewis. The 24-year-old paddled and paddled, unwittingly swimming towards his demise. The fish around the area scrambled in fear, making way for the king. The shark appeared from the shadows, rearing its formidable head into the light. But Lewis did not see the creature. The gloomy weather ensured anything a few meters below him would stay where they were, in the dark, out of sight, and out of mind. It moved like a submarine, precise, deadly, and cautious. The 400 million years of evolution taught it to become almost invisible in the ocean, following the movements of its prey. The great white shark followed Lewis. Still unknown of the danger, Lewis's fate was sealed at that very moment. Placing itself strategically a few feet below the surfboard, the great white shark suddenly went into gear, propelling 2,000 pounds of brute force towards the surface. The water exploded into chaos. The creature's massive jaws laced with five rows of teeth clamped onto Lewis as he paddled away at the water. It was like a train had struck him. The immense force knocked Lewis back from his surfboard, causing him to sink into the depths of the ocean. The single curious bite removed a portion of Lewis's left chest. Before he knew and understood what was happening, he was already dying. Lewis faded into the depths, instantly succumbing to his injury. The water drew its curtains, hiding the horror underneath it. And just like that, the eerie silence of South Moss Beach swept away the tragic fate of Lewis Archer Boren. December 20th, 1981, the following day. Two surfers were walking along Moss Beach when they discovered a surfboard with a portion missing in the matching section about 15 yards away. The two surfers took these parts and handed them over to Salinas Police Department. Eventually, they passed it on to the supervising ranger at the beach. Monday, December 21st, a missing persons report was filed by one of Lewis's friends over concerns that his vehicle had not been moved from the beach since he was last seen. They feared the worst, and they were asking the same question. Where was Lewis? Their answer was swept by the cold currents on the morning of Thursday, December 22nd. Around 11 a.m., Lewis's remains floated in a small cove approximately one kilometer north of Spanish Bay. After being taken to the Paul Mortuary in Pacific Grove, it was identified as Lewis. An autopsy was done. Severe trauma, left chest, shark bite. Lewis was bitten only once. Subsequent investigations of the bite marks revealed something even more sinister. Based on the segment chopped from the surfboard, a marine biologist concluded that the shark's jaws were 18 inches wide. This indicated the shark's length was more or less 23 feet, weighing two tons. They had no doubt it was a great white shark and the largest ever documented. In all metrics, Lewis was no match. According to experts, sharks do not attack people purposely, as they don't consider humans part of their food source. In Lewis's case, it was more likely an exploratory bite, and unfortunately, the behemoth shark was never seen again. Humans have remained on top of the food chain for the longest time. Thanks to their highly sophisticated language, coordination, and innovation, humanity has managed to control the environment to their liking, turning their surroundings into what would benefit the population best. However, we must all remember the ocean is one of the few remaining places we have yet to fully explore, and those who aren't careful enough are in for a rude awakening. Whether a shark attacks you because of mistaken identity or out of pure hunger, when a shark attacks, there's a high possibility of you meeting your final affliction. Boyfriend and girlfriend Roy Stoddard and Tamara McAllister were two 24-year-olds who met whilst teaching in the same school in West Malibu, California. They initially bonded over their sense for adventure. Tamara was preparing for public health work in Kenya as part of her master's degree. Roy turned his hand to anything from mountain climbing, biking, and surfing to scuba diving and kayaking. The two of them spent all their spare time hiking, camping, and kayaking together. 
On Thursday, January 26, 1989, the couple were training for a triathlon that they were planning on competing in together. In preparation for the upcoming race, they kayaked and swam daily. Their usual route took them on a three-mile round trip from Latigo Point to Paradise Cove. They each took a single-man kayak into the water on that fateful day. They headed down to the water just before 9 a.m. Pausing on the sand, they both sat down and enjoyed a hot cup of coffee and a muffin to kickstart their day. A passerby saw them launch at 9.30 before they paddled northwards around Latigo Point and on towards Paradise Cove. It was like any of their other training days. The couple were happy and excited to spend the time together. The wind was light and the seas were fairly calm. As they paddled into the sea that day, they were never to return again. There were no further sightings of the couple alive. Tamara's body was found two days later. This story is based on the findings and subsequent report by the case investigator Ralph Collier. The following is one of the number of possibilities that could have happened to the couple and is based on circumstantial evidence. After finishing their coffee, they put on their windbreakers and zipped them up over their swimsuits. These were blue and black wetsuit style jackets that kept them warm on the open water. As the wind was picking up, there was a chill in the air. The couple paddled to about 100 yards out, remaining shoreside of the kelp beds. They knew it was safer not to paddle beyond the kelp forests as more often than not, they act as a natural deterrent to sharks. After heading around Latigo Point, the wind buffeted them. It whipped the surface of the sea, the salt spray wetting their faces and stinging their eyes. They bowed their heads against it, digging in and persevering. The training route usually took them 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how long they stopped for a swim at the halfway point. Today, it was taking them a bit longer. They lashed their kayaks together, as Tamara was being blown off course. The momentary pause in paddling gave them a breather and some respite. They decided to continue. Roy made headway in the lead kayak, cutting a wake for Tamara to follow. He felt the tugging of the rope every so often as it went taut, pulling Tamara back on course. It wasn't long before they could see their halfway destination, Paradise Cove, but they never made it. Suddenly, without warning, there was a tremendous smash from below the water. Something from the depths torpedoed upwards and struck the boats from underneath. The two of them were thrown from their kayaks and slammed into the sea. Tamara resurfaced coughing and sputtering, unsure of what had just happened. Seconds later, she felt a tremendous tug on her left thigh and was pulled underwater. Kicking and thrashing around, she desperately tried to pull herself to the surface but a shark had a strong grip of her leg. She could feel her lungs about to burst as the shark twisted and turned underwater. Roy had knocked his head on his kayak when he had been thrown into the ocean. Dazed and dizzy, he frantically blinked trying to make sense of the situation. Seconds later, he heard the terrified screams of his girlfriend as she momentarily resurfaced. He wheeled around to see a sea of red and their upturned kayaks bobbing in the water. He immediately swam over to the commotion and managed to grab Tamara's hand. Pulling her above the surface of the water, she gasped for breath. He held on to her, trying desperately to pull her to the boats. The hulls of the kayaks were wet and slippery. Each time he tried to grab on, his hand would slip. He lifted one side, trying to flip it back over, but the weight was immense and whilst holding on to Tamara with one arm, he didn't have the strength to right the boat. He tried again and again. The commotion in the water was witnessed by Margaret Bloom. As she looked out of her living room windows at 10.15 that morning, she noticed an incredible boiling of the water and thrashing about. It was out past the kelp beds near a large United States Coast Guard buoy. She spotted a number of seals leap out of the water onto the surface of the buoy, avoiding the churning sea. They were anxious and agitated. It is unclear whether this commotion was a shark attacking one of the seals or whether it was the actual attack on Tamara and Roy. If it was the former and had unsuccessfully caught a seal, the same shark may have turned its attention to the kayaks a few moments later. As Roy held on to Tamara, keeping her afloat, he could feel her slipping away. The shark had severed her femoral artery and she was bleeding out, but the shark hadn't finished yet. It returned and in a frantic attack, it took hold of Roy and dragged him underwater. 
never to be seen again. When the couple didn't show up to work the next day, their friends and colleagues raised the alarm. People knew that Tamara and Roy had taken the kayaks out and they knew their routine paddle. The kayaks were found the day after the attack. They were floating and upturned less than 20 miles from where the couple had paddled, on the opposite side of Santa Monica Bay. The kayaks had stress fractures along their holes and one had a hole in the bow. On examination of this evidence, an engineer suggested that significant impact and force would cause this kind of damage. The object that struck the kayaks needed to have been in excess of 2,000 pounds or 900 kilograms and traveling at least 17 knots. These are characteristics of a great white shark. These incredible apex predators are also known to attack their prey from behind or from underneath, often shooting out of the water as they do so. The following day, the crew of a sailing boat found Tamara's body floating in the water. The current had carried her 30 miles north of Paradise Cove, near Channel Islands Harbor. She was still wearing her jacket, which suggests that she wasn't swimming when she was attacked. Her injuries included deep bite wounds to her upper thighs. One had severed her femoral artery and vein, and the other measured more than 34 centimeters or 13 inches in diameter. She had bruising to her hand and head, possibly from being thrown from her kayak. From the size of the bite marks and severity of the injuries, it was concluded that a great white shark measuring at least five feet long had been the cause of the fatality. Following the discovery of Tamara's body, the United States Coast Guard conducted a search and rescue operation by both boat and helicopter to try and find Roy. After a week-long search, no trace of him was ever found. This devastating attack happened within sight of the shore, and yet no one witnessed it. The young couple were both fit and adventurous. Although Tamara was new to kayaking, Roy had been on the water since childhood, and both were exceptional swimmers. Their lives were cut tragically short, simply doing what they loved. While the ocean and its beaches provide us with some of nature's greatest playgrounds, we must remember that this is the shark's habitat, not ours. And despite how experienced and prepared you might be, one encounter with these murderous creatures can lead you to your unfortunate final affliction. Saturday, June 5th, 1993, husband and wife Ian and Terry Cartwright were heading out to sea with their five children. Ian was skippering the Australian maritime college vessel, Riveresco, in the Bass Strait just off of the Tasmanian coast. They were headed to the Baron Joey Seal Convoy on 10th Island. This island is an uninhabited granite outcrop, home to a large breeding colony of Australian sea lions. With up to 400 sea lion pups born every year, the area is a nature reserve offering some excellent diving and snorkeling experiences. Conserving this habitat is important to marine biodiversity and scientific research. Terry Cartwright worked with staff in the Australian Maritime College at the University of Tasmania. The other divers on board Riveresco included Stephen Ears, a marine fisheries lecturer at the college, and his colleague, Josephine Osborne. Stephen had invited Terry and Josephine along to enjoy the research he was conducting and observe the behavior of the sea lions. Terry was eager to join in and experience the interactions with the sea lions. They were well known in the area for being very interactive with divers, often displaying playfulness and coming very close to the people in the water. Terry asked Ian to anchor in a channel on the southern side of the island. Ian motored the boat to the spot and released the anchor chain. The depth reader read 15 meters, and they were about 150 meters from the mainland. Ian and Terry's children leaned over the side of the boat and watched as the anchor splashed into the water and disappeared into the depths. With the calm seas, it was easy for Terry, Stephen, and Josephine to put on their gear. Terry slipped into a two-piece wetsuit. She pulled the hood up over her head and slipped into her yellow fins. Stephen lifted her yellow air cylinder onto her back and Terry clipped it up. Stephen dropped into the water first. He signaled that it was okay to the rest of the crew and he began swimming away from the boat. Second to enter the water was Terry, closely followed by Josephine. Terry was an experienced scuba diver, but hadn't been in the water for over a year. She was excited to be back amongst the marine wildlife that she loved so much. Once in the water, Terry signaled that she was okay, but she was fumbling with her equipment. 
She bobbed about on the surface as she tried to adjust the regulator in her mask. Assuming Terry was close behind them, Stephen and Josephine began swimming on the surface of the water towards 10th Island. As they did so, seals came swimming up to them, their whiskered faces merely inches from their masks. Stephen ducked his head underwater. Below them, the sea lions were darting about, swimming up to the diver's feet and then swimming back down. The sea was a hive of activity. Terry's husband, Ian, and another crew member, Ian Rinkin, both shouted at Terry, signaling for her to hurry up and catch up to the others. She was lagging behind and it was safer for them to stick together as a group. Finally, Terry sorted out her equipment and turned around to see her friends 20 meters away. She swam to catch up. Despite not being in the water for a long time, Terry was a fit 35-year-old and caught up to the others in no time. The three of them bobbed on the surface together for a few moments before descending just meters from the rocks of 10th Island. As they dropped beneath the ocean's surface, Terry marveled at the scenery. The visibility was fantastic and she watched as the sea lions glided by effortlessly. Stephen and Josephine made it to the bottom of the ocean and looked up to see Terry paused in her descent. Terry felt the pressure build in her ears. She pinched her nose and blew, but nothing happened. Each time she continued to dive deeper, the pressure in her ears grew. She tried again and again to equalize her ears. Then suddenly, from out of nowhere, she was hit with an incredible force. It knocked the air from her lungs as she was thrown through the water. The regulator was ripped from her mouth and an explosion of bubbles surrounded her. Stephen and Josephine hovered just above the sea floor, shocked as they saw a 15-foot great white shark torpedo directly into Terry. Disoriented, Terry wheeled around as the shark came at her once more. Its enormous mouth clamped down around her torso and she let out a muted cry. Air bubbles escaping from her mouth, Stephen and Josephine looked on in horror as a shadow of red engulfed their friend. As the shark ravaged her, thrashing her body around in the water, they hid behind the underwater rocks, hardly daring to peek over the top. The sea lions all dispersed, swimming away or leaping out of the water onto the island. The two divers froze in terror. They desperately wanted to reach Terry, but they couldn't see where the shark was. Then, as Stephen decided to make a dash towards Terry's limp body, they saw the toothy grin of the shark emerge through the red-stained murkiness. Its powerful tail drove it through the water at 16 miles per hour. Its top lip curled backwards as its immense jaws opened once more and grabbed hold of Terry again. It dragged her deeper and deeper until Terry was out of sight. Stephen and Josephine made a dash for the island and resurfaced as quickly as they could. Ian and the children had been watching from the boat. They had seen a commotion but were unaware of the horror that had occurred in the depths. When Stephen and Josephine frantically made it out of the water and onto 10th Island, they shouted and screamed at Ian to bring the boat over. Knowing there was some kind of emergency and seeing that Terry hadn't resurfaced, Ian Cartwright and Ian Rinkin jumped into the 11-foot dinghy and rowed as quickly as they could to the island. Hearing the heart-stopping news of his wife, the distraught Ian took charge and searched the area in his boat for over half an hour. He then had to deliver the devastating news to their six-year-old quadruplets and 11-month-old son who were waiting patiently on the boat. With no sign of Terry above the water, Ian radioed Bell Bay for help and a sea and air search was initiated. During the afternoon, pieces of Terry's wetsuit surfaced a kilometer away from the attack site. One of her legs with the yellow fin still attached was also pulled from the sea. No other trace of Terry was ever found. When we enter the enchanting underwater world of the marine environment, we must always remember that we are amongst predators of all kinds and that this is their domain, not ours. With an abundance of prey in the waters off 10th Island, great white sharks frequent the area. They typically take young sea lion pups that are inexperienced in the water. Any injured sea lions or stragglers are easy pickings for a 15-foot great white. As Terry had paused midway in the water column, suspended briefly as she tried to equalize her ears, she may have been interpreted as a struggling sea lion. Dressed predominantly in black and amongst swarms of sea lions, many believe that it was a case of mistaken identity. A devastating and heartbreaking case of mistaken identity that led Terry Cartwright to her horrifying final affliction. 
Liam, Harris, and Samantha had come to the new Smyrna Beach in Florida to make the most of their vacation. The three friends had met in college and got along because of their shared wanderlust and proclivity to push boundaries in pursuit of adventure. The beach was bustling with surfers, tanners, and volleyball players, but none of this gave them the adrenaline rush they were seeking. The place was also famed as a global hotspot for shark attacks, and Liam had challenged the group to spend two nights off of its coast in a small yacht. Despite some reluctance from Samantha, the trio finally took a yacht and sailed off a few kilometers from the shore. The first night spent on the boat was calm and serene. The water was beautiful, the moonlight brightened their night, and the silence drifted off into deep conversations. Samantha had brought steak and beef ribs for their time at sea, and the three friends savored the food and drinks on the yacht through the entire night. But unknown to them, there lurked a creature beneath the water that was drawn to the scent of the meat from miles away. The new Smyrna Beach is a shark's favorite hunting spot. The great whites of the area were aware of human activity and had come to see them as potential prey. They are known as the most formidable shark species in the world, and one with a particular disdain for humans, as evidenced by the thousands of recorded incidents and fatalities. With multiple rows of serrated teeth that can grow up to six inches in length, a single bite from a great white shark is enough to tear through flesh and rip its prey in half. They can grow up to 14 feet long and are the apex predators of the underwater world sitting comfortably at the top of the marine food chain. As night turned to day, it was the trio's last few hours in the water before they headed back to the beach. After an uneventful start to the day, the three friends yearned for the kind of exciting rush they had come looking for. Harris was hungry and asked if the steak from last night was still left. Liam nodded and picked up a plate to hand to Harris. Perhaps slightly bored, Liam decided to toy with Harris and threw him a piece of steak to catch. Harris played along and in trying to catch the piece, fell into the water. He quickly climbed back to the boat laughing. It seemed as though the trio found this an interesting play in the middle of the ocean, throwing each other pieces of meat and sometimes falling into the water trying to catch it. But they didn't know that they were creating the perfect storm for a disaster to happen. The commotion in the water, coupled with the scent of the falling stakes, alerted sharks nearby. Great white sharks have the most acute sense of smell of any marine creature, being able to spot one part in 10 billion parts water even from a mile away. The predator followed its way to the boat and started circling it underneath. The trio had no clue the danger they were in, while the shark swam under the surface trying to gauge the situation. Harris once again fell into the water while catching the meat. They were laughing and having a great time, but now the shark was directly underneath them. A few seconds passed with Liam and Samantha playing and laughing on the boat when it suddenly occurred to them that Harris wasn't with them. They looked for him on the boat and peeked underneath thinking that he was playing a prank on them. Then they saw the water a few feet away turning red, and this is when panic started to set in. When Harris was in the water, a great white shark had bit his thigh and pulled him underwater before he could even have a chance to scream. His cries for help were muffled by the water as he was torn to pieces by the shark, killing him instantly. Both now realized that something had gone terribly wrong. Liam put his head under the water trying to see beneath. He witnessed a 14-foot shark swimming towards him from under the water like a long torpedo. They had no time to process the gravity of the situation as Liam quickly got back up and started the engine to turn the boat back towards the shore. The yacht was slow to pick up speed and it was not long after that they heard a bang from the side. The shark hit the underbelly of the yacht making it wobble back and forth in the water. Liam lost his balance and got knocked off the boat. Terrified and splashing in the water, he desperately tried to swim back and climb to safety. Samantha cried and screamed to Liam in helplessness, and then she saw a dreaded fin a few feet behind him. The shark had noticed another vulnerable body in the water and made its way back for another kill. As the fin approached closer near Liam, a huge gaping mouth emerged from under the surface, sucking in the water and pulling Liam closer to the shark. Liam was now inches away from the boat, but he was breathless and terrified out of his senses. That's when the shark bit him across his torso and in a single bite plunged its razor-sharp teeth deep into his flesh. 
Liam could offer little resistance as petrified Samantha screamed and pleaded for help. But there was no one to hear her and they were still several kilometers away from the shore. Liam let out a little squeal as the shark violently moved its head back and forth above the water, ripping Liam's body in half. The scene made Samantha numb from fear. She realized she was the only one still safe and frantically tried to steer the boat to the shore despite not knowing how to pilot it. She finally made it to solid land and let all her emotions loose after coming to grips with the scale of the tragedy. She had just lost two of her closest friends and watched them die in the most brutal and heartless fashion at the hands of a marine predator. She was grateful to have been left alive. There was not much that could be salvaged from the site to identify her friends' bodies apart from a few floating clothes drifting in the blood-stained water. The incident was an addition to Florida's history of gruesome great white shark attacks, and Liam and Harris were unfortunately just the next victims for this formidable sea monster. A story to remind us all that even while vacationing with friends, it can quickly turn to our unfortunate final affliction. Wednesday, October 27, 1937. Storm clouds were gathering above the sea in Gold Coast, Australia. The water was warm and choppy. The light was gloomy with the sun barely breaking through the clouds. After work, a group of six friends headed to the pristine golden sands of Kira Beach. They entered the water just after 5 p.m. that evening. There were some good breakers about 90 yards out between the shore and a sand spit. Whilst the rest of the group headed in after a quick swim and splash about, Norman Gervin, Gordon Doniger, and Jack Brinkley remained in the surf. They had their bodyboards with them and they were waiting for the perfect wave to ride back in. It never came. Instead, Norman felt a sudden tug on his leg. He cried out in horror as he realized a shark was attacking him. Waving his arms above his head, desperately trying to capture the attention of his friends, the shark tore through his skin. Gordon thought Norman was messing around and told him to ride the next wave in. As the next wave began to peak, Gordon noticed a sea of red surrounding his screaming friend. He dashed over to him. Gordon grabbed Norman's arm, but realizing it was barely hanging on, he repositioned himself behind Norman, trying to support him in the water whilst kicking out at the shark. He shouted to their friend Jack, who was swimming 10 yards away, and Jack rushed over. As Gordon tried desperately to pull Norman towards the shore, Jack stopped dead in the water. He began kicking and thrashing around. In a frenzy, the shark had turned on him. Jack punched and slapped the water, shouting out in fear. Panic gripped Gordon as he clung on to his friend, watching in horror as Jack was now attacked. Moments later, the shark was back for Norman. Gordon felt a sharp tug as it grabbed Norman's leg once more and began to shake him vigorously. Gordon held on as tightly as he could. His hand was slashed by the shark and in that instant, he momentarily loosened his grip. Norman somberly looked Gordon in his eye and spoke his last haunting words. I'm gone, he said, goodbye. And with that, Norman slipped through Gordon's fingers and was gone. Still 70 yards from the shore, Gordon and Jack made a mad swim for it. Frantically, they raced through the water, heads down. With every muscle fiber pumping their arms and legs as fast as they could go, adrenaline was coursing through their bodies. In a moment of terror, Gordon glanced to his side and saw the shark coming right at him. Miraculously, he managed to reach out and push it away. He pushed off from it as it slipped beneath him, and he felt a surge as a wave from behind him torpedoed him to shore but the shark wasn't finished. Missing Gordon, it glided through the surf and made a beeline for Jack. As it launched itself at Jack, he cried out, and from the beach, Gordon's brother Joe leapt into the water. He ducked and dived under the waves, each time bobbing back up to see his friends splashing, coughing, and sputtering. The rough water slapped him in the face mercilessly as he tried again and again to reach Jack. He could see the shark's fin as it circled its prey. After what seemed like an eternity, Joe finally grabbed hold of Jack. If I hadn't tried to save him, it wouldn't have got me, said Jack. Supporting him around his chest, Joe swam powerfully back towards the shore. He momentarily looked back and saw the shark emerge from the water, its razor-sharp serrated teeth only inches from his face. 
the rest of its body submerged as an eerie shadow just below the surface. Joe estimated it to be about eight feet long. It clamped down on Jack's left arm, twisting and pulling. Joe refused to let go. Jack groaned in agony. Blood poured from his gaping wound as the shark finally let go. He passed out from the trauma and Joe felt the heavy dead weight of his friend. His legs burned and his lungs felt as if though they were on fire as he heroically hauled his friend through the choppy surf. The beach was tantalizingly close. He could see the crowd of people now gathered on the sand, urging him to hurry as he inched ever closer to the shore. He glanced back over his shoulder. The splashing waves made it difficult to spot an approaching shark. Every second that passed, Joe anticipated the return of the shark from the murky depths. Eventually, Joe made it back to the safety of the shore. He dragged his friend onto dry land, gasping for air. The rest of the group gathered around and rapidly made a tourniquet around Jack's severed arm. The emergency services arrived shortly after and rushed Jack off to the hospital. He remained conscious throughout the entire ordeal. Miraculously, Joe had initially saved Jack's life. But tragedy struck once more. Surgeons were unable to save his arm, and he died in the hospital the next day. It was a devastating loss of two young men. Once Joe and Jack had made it to shore, one of the group, Alf Kilburn, jumped onto a jet ski to search for Norman. He skimmed over the ocean surface and then, just beyond the breakers, he stopped in his tracks. He saw a large pool of blood-stained water and there, circling it, was a huge tiger shark. Alf returned to the beach. Tiger sharks can grow to a massive 20 feet long. There have even been sightings of 25-foot tiger sharks. They are distinctive by their dark, tiger-like stripes on their skin. They frequent coastal waters and coral reefs. For this reason, they are more likely to come in contact with people. Although tiger shark attacks on humans are rare, they are the second most common after great white sharks. The next day, some of Norman's remains washed ashore. Lifesavers and local experts headed out in a motorboat and managed to catch a large female tiger shark. She measured 11 and a half foot long, had a girth of six feet, and weighed 850 pounds. When the shark was cut open, there were distinct human remains inside, including Norman's hand, which was distinguishable by a unique scar he had. There are over 20 shark attacks in Australian waters every year. Of these attacks, two to three are fatal. Today, some of Australia's coastlines are protected by shark nets and drumlines. It is easy to fear these apex predators and turn to drastic measures such as culling them in hope of protecting people. But sharks are essential to the marine environment. As apex predators, they maintain the balance within the food chain. When shark populations are threatened, coral reefs, seagrass beds, and commercial fisheries all decline. Each of these habitats is vital to a whole host of other species, not least the survival of human beings. Tiger sharks are formidable predators. Like most sharks, they have specialized adaptations to enable them to hunt proficiently. They can detect electrical signals produced by their prey and can see in murky water and low light. There is very little that tiger sharks won't eat, but their main prey consists of fish and mollusks to sea turtles, dolphins, and sea lions. But as we've seen in today's story, they sometimes eat humans. And if you ever find yourself unknowingly swimming with them, you could very easily meet your unexpected final affliction. In July 1994, terror was about to grip the South African community. Unbeknownst to swimmers and surfers, sharks had been attracted to South Africa's coastlines in the recent weeks. They had followed the abundant salmon and seals in the area, as well as the recent calving of southern right and humpback whales. On Saturday, July 9, 1994, two friends in their 20s, Bruce Corby and Andrew Carter, decided it was a great day to hit the waves on their surfboards. They headed to one of the best surfing spots in the Eastern Cape, Nahoon Reef. Home to some international surf competitions, Nahoon offers great waves for more competent surfers. As the two friends took their boards off the roof of their car, they looked out to sea. From the clear blue sky, the winter sun was glistening on the water's surface. The air temperature was about 24 degrees Celsius. The waves were nearing two meters high with a gentle breeze in the air. They were lovely surfing conditions, 
and a few surfers were already riding the waves. Bruce and Andrew strapped their leashes to their ankles and paddled out about 200 meters from the shore. Just beyond the breakers, the water was 8 to 12 foot deep over a submerged reef. They were enjoying their time together, feeling the thrill as they caught wave after wave. Andrew was a champion surfer, winning both South African and European titles. After the two had been surfing for about half an hour, Andrew suddenly felt a massive bang from behind him. Before turning his head to look, Andrew knew it was a shark. As he wheeled his head around, he came face to face with a 12-foot great white shark. An indescribable terror gripped him. He saw the enormous shark's jaws clamp around his legs, stripping flesh from bone in one bite, and he felt desperately helpless. It was like nothing he had ever felt before. Initially, as the adrenaline was pumping, he felt no pain, only an immense crushing feeling as the shark closed its jaws around his entire leg. He yelled, letting out an ear-piercing scream, while desperately trying to fight the shark off. The sea turned red, and Andrew thought this was the end. Another surfer who was nearby saw the drama unfolding, and in a mad panic, he left Andrew and paddled to shore in a desperate attempt to escape himself. As the shark continued its ferocious attack, Andrew held onto his surfboard with all his might, refusing to be taken underwater. Momentarily, the shark loosened its grip and Andrew slid off the board. As the shark came for him again, Andrew shoved the board into the shark's mouth. It chomped down on the surfboard, thrashing its enormous head from side to side as it did so. Andrew desperately paddled two or three strokes away, but the shore was a long way away. He knew he couldn't outswim the shark. The beach was still 200 yards out of reach. He would either bleed out before making it or would be taken by the shark. He glanced backwards and saw the enormous beast let go of the board and submerge below the surface. He knew it was coming after him. Bravely, he scrambled back to his board and climbed on. Seeing the commotion in the water, another surfer, John Bourne, quickly paddled over to Andrew. Amidst the sea of red, he saw an approaching wave and knew that this was Andrew's only chance. He shouted at Andrew to ride the wave in. Miraculously, the six-foot wave carried Andrew away from the jaws of the shark. He had caught the luckiest wave of his life. His leg was barely hanging on, and he willed the wave to push him faster and faster to safety. He dared not look back, fearing the shark was trailing him. Mercifully, he made it to the shore. He screamed for help. Two girls who were sunbathing ran over to him, dragging him onto the sand. They laid him down, ripping off one of their tops to make a tourniquet around his legs. The shark's bite had almost taken his entire leg from his hip to his foot. It was hanging on by a few inches of flesh. His vision became blurred, and then the lights went out. Andrew heard muffled voices as he felt life slipping away from him. As he readied himself for death to consume him, Andrew felt calm and at peace with himself. He thought of his life well lived, of his friends, of his family. But paramedics soon arrived on the scene and rushed him off to the hospital, saving his life. Andrew's ordeal was far from over, but at least he was out of the water. The shark, however, hadn't finished yet. Moments after attacking Andrew, it leapt out of the water. The 12-foot giant had turned its attention to Andrew's friend, Bruce. He cried out as it grabbed hold of his leg. Viciously, it shook him, tearing him from his surfboard. As he was slammed into the water, the air was knocked from his lungs. Fighting for the surface, Bruce felt the full force of the shark's grip on his leg. The pressure was immense, and then it gave way. The shark severed Bruce's right leg completely off just above the knee. This freed Bruce, who was then able to swim for the surface. Reaching the sunlight, Bruce gasped for air. The shark continued its attack, biting frantically at his surfboard. Another surfer arrived on the scene as Bruce was thrashing about in his own blood. He tried to get Bruce onto his board, but in a panic, he couldn't. Bleeding profusely, Bruce scrambled back onto his own board and made a frenzied swim towards shore. With the help of a wave, he bodyboarded towards the jagged rocks. He cried out, my leg is gone, I've just lost my leg. Other surfers in the area came to his aid and pulled him from the surf. Using another surfboard as a stretcher, they carried Bruce over the rocks to the car park. Bruce had been conscious up until then. Laying down in the car park, 
He lost consciousness due to the massive blood loss. Within two minutes of making it to shore, Bruce had stopped breathing. Paramedics on the scene managed to revive him and stabilize him before taking him to the nearby hospital. Tragically, Bruce never regained consciousness and died the next day at just 22 years old. Shortly after the attack, Andrew moved to the UK for several months respite. He has been continually haunted by the tragic memories of that day. The doctor said he may never walk again, but not only is Andrew back walking, he is also surfing off of Britain's southwest coast. He has kept the surfboard to this day, blood still smeared on its surface and a huge bite mark taken out of one side. It's a reminder to him of how lucky he has been. A reminder that no matter how excellent we may be at surfing or swimming, when it comes to sharks, we can still be considered prey. There have been a number of reports involving multiple shark attacks within minutes of each other. It seems this shark was angry at its unsuccessful attack on Andrew, and so its attack on Bruce had been more brutal and more persistent. People talk of mistaken identity when it comes to shark attacks, and it's often reported that sharks will swim away after the initial bite on a human since it isn't their usual prey. But this time, it was different. This time the shark came back for more, bringing Bruce Corby to his unfortunate final affliction.